Welcome, welcome, welcome. Tea time again with Miss Liz. That's right. It is evening tea and we are going to spill the TEA tonight on self-publishing. That's right. I am joined with Mark Leslie in the studio tonight and we are going to spill some really good, strong educational tea tonight. So before we get started, we're going to do the disclaimer and then a little intro of Mark and then Mark's going to jump in and we're going to share some TEA with you and some self-publishing. So the disclaimer for Miss Liz's live tea time live shows. Miss Liz myself is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any tea time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forth dialogue and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the given time of airing. All tea time guests and audience participation and participants are responsible for using their good judgment in taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussion for some where they may be emotionally at risk. And to know that this show is engaging in discussion forms only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about this disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in this show in any aspect, I, Miss Miss Liz, welcomes you. Should you decide that this show is not made for you at this time, I respect that and I will see you at a later show at a later date and time. Now, let me get you a little info on tonight's guest. Tonight we have... Canada's largest independent self-publisher. That's right. We have Mark Leslie in the house. He has been writing since he was 13 years old and discovered his mother's Underwood typewriter collecting dust in the, in, in the, in the closet. He started submitting his work for publication at the age of 15 and had his first story published in 1992. Wow, I had my first child in 1992. The same year he graduated from university under the name Mark Leslie, he has published more than a dozen full-length books. He pens a series of nonfiction paranormal explore, explorations for Dun Dundon, Canada's largest independent publisher. He is also writes frictions, typically thrillers and horror, and edits friction anthologies, most recently as a regular editor for the WMG Publishing Friction Rivers Anthology Series. Now, for more on Mark, you can check out his full bio on Miss Liz's Facebook page. So let me grab my guest tonight and welcome Mark. Welcome, Mark. It is an honor to have hey, you Ms. here Liz. tonight. <laughs> I'm so excited to have some tea with you tonight. Right? And we're going to share a different type of tea tonight because that's what Miss Liz does is we share different tea. So, Mark, let's get started. In 1992, the, the Mark that first wrote his first book. Let's hear a little bit about that. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I've been writing my entire life. I started when I was a teenager. I amassed um, rejection after rejection after rejection. Started to sell some of my short story uh, to small press magazines. But the very first one, the very first one that saw print was in 1992. And it was a small press magazine called Chapter One. It was a YA humor story that my writing teacher, my grade 13 writing teacher, uh, had commented when she first read it, and I ended up selling it later. She had said, um, I've never seen the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off, but this story reminds me of what that movie might be like. So <clears throat> I was very um, pleased with that because I, I'm still a huge fan of John Hughes. Uh, but 92 was also the year I graduated from university and also the year that I started working in the book industry and I've worked in every aspect of book selling. Um, 
uh, mall store, big box chain store, independent bookstore, academic bookstore, online bookstore, ebook store. I've worked in uh, almost every kind of bookstore, uh, except uh, used books and uh, Christian bookstores are two of the kinds I have not yet worked in. And so I've been in the industry as both a writer and as a book industry consultant or representative or bookseller or whatever uh, the roles have been over the years uh, for 30 years now. So it's been uh, an amazing voyage. And, and I just love the fact that I've, I've gotten to pursue my passion for writing, which is which is big, but also my passion for books. I've always been a giant book nerd. So having surrounded myself with the book business almost feels like I've never really worked a day in my life. And I love the word yet. You said yet. So you are working on getting into those places. Well, you never know, right? Like where, where the future is going to take you. So I, I, I don't want to close doors. Uh, I, I want to explore all the possibilities, all the options. So what got you into self-publishing? So the very first uh, book I self-published was 2004. So I had um, sold a bunch of stories to small press magazines and I was... Um, working in the book industry, working at a bookstore. And people would say, so you're a writer. And I'd say, yeah, I'm a writer. And they'd say, well, where can I get your writing? And I'd say, well, interesting story. Okay, so um, there is a small press magazine published out of Black River, New York State. And if you go and drive down south across the border a few hours, you get into this town. There's the magazine. It's on the shelf. 500 copies, small press circulation. Oh, oh, but you know what? It's already October and, you know, it was only on the shelf till the end of September. So I was getting these stories published, but they weren't, they weren't available anyway. They weren't available in bookstores. So <clears throat> I'd learned um, about the print-on-demand technology that was uh, allowed you the ability to create a PDF file and, and, and for a cost, set up your book through Ingram, uh, which had a print-on-demand service called Lightning Source. They still do. It powers a lot of other print-on-demand services. And <clears throat> I collected a whole bunch of my short stories that were previously published, and I decided to self-publish. I, I uh, <clears throat> registered the company Stark, Stark Publishing. I um, uh, had my uh, best friend, uh, who's a graphic designer, design the logo for me because I wanted to hide behind the fact that I was self-publishing. Um, all of my friends who were writers had said the best way to kill your career is to self-publish. and uh, But I, I felt justified in self-publishing and getting the book One Hand Screaming Out, a collection of stories is still available. And, and the reason I felt justified was 90% of the stories, in it, there, there were a few previously unpublished stories that I put in there. But most of the stories had already been published in small press magazines. They'd already gone through the slush piles. They'd already been accepted out of you know thousands of submissions the editor chose the story that they had been edited by editors and so i felt yes it's self-publishing but it's more just a hey if you want to get my stories they're all now available in this book and <clears throat> that kind of that kind of started it for me i realized that i could self-publish some work i could traditionally publish some other work and and i've kind of done a little bit of of both and so i've sort of embraced both sides of the industry so what's the difference between self-publishing and publishing? The main difference, if you do it properly, the only self in self-publishing should be self-directed. Not that you do everything yourself. Because again, you need an editor. Uh, everyone needs an editor. Everyone needs that second set of eyes or third set of eyes to, to work with you, whether it's developmental, edit, copy edit. And then, and then on top of that, and I'm just not just talking about proofread for typos. I'm talking about the, the actual experience of working with a professional who knows what they're doing. When you go to a publisher, a real publisher, the publisher pays you. They give you an advance and they pay you royalties based on sales because the publisher, real publishers, and there's a lot of people pretending to be publishers who ask authors for money, uh, vanity publishing. The, if, if the publisher believes your book is worthwhile, that they're going to sell it, they make the money off of the sales of the book, not off of charging the author for <laughs> publishing the book. So with a publisher they have uh, in either in-house or freelance editors. They have the de designers and formatters, and they also have access to the distribution network to get your book in the bookstores and libraries, et cetera. When you're self-publishing, you're doing it all yourself. Now, 
That means hiring an editor or working with an editor and, and, and designers and then figuring out how am I going to get the distribution? And so there are free platforms online that you can use. Amazon has Kindle Direct Publishing here in Canada. Kobo Writing Life, I was one of the creators of the Kobo Writing Life platform, so you could publish your books directly to Kobo. <clears throat> I also work uh, now for draft to digital and draft to digital is a distributor that allows you to you know, upload a manuscript that gets converted into EPUB for free. And you can use draft to digital to distribute to a bunch of libraries and retail platforms. So when you're self-publishing, you're really in control. You're the publisher. And when you're publishing, you're licensing your rights to a publisher so they can do a lot of those logistics. So I don't think one is better than the other. I think for writers, one option for this particular book may be better. And, and in my case, some of the books that I publish, if I believe that they're going to sell better in print, it may make more sense to go with a publisher because they have access to distribution. Like Dundurn, Canada's largest independent publisher, I do a lot of true ghost story books with them. They have got my books into you know indie bookstores and chain bookstores. They've got my books into Walmart. They've got my book into Costco. And so <clears throat> I can't do that uh, as a, as a self-publisher because they're paying for warehouse space and stuff like that. And as an independent publisher, as an indie author, I can't afford to print a thousand copies and have them stored in a warehouse where I have to pay rent. So as an indie author, I can use the print on demand and, service. And, okay. no, go go ahead. ahead, Mark. I think you froze for a second. I, I I, this is why I wanted to have you on because I want people to understand that there is different parts of publishing, right? And yeah. I'm glad that you brought up the vanity publishing because there are a lot of people that are saying they're publishers and they're not. And I think a lot of people need to be aware of this because yeah. a lot of people are saying, well, I'm paying you to be in your book. What are you giving me? But you're not giving me nothing in the end. Well, what's the, you know, you're getting my story. You're getting my part. But what am I getting? And I think we really need to get that out there. And we need that education out there for a lot of people, because that's a choice and you can make for yourself that you're willing to not make a profit for sharing your story. You're willing to just share your story to make a difference, right? Yeah. And, and that is a case for some people. They may not want to have to do all that work. They may not want to have to go and find an editor and find a designer. So in some cases, uh, there are publishers out there where you can say, hey, I'll give you $5,000 and they take care of the editing and stuff like that and distribution. And that may be a case where the author doesn't, doesn't want to worry about making money or any of those things. Where I get really frustrated on behalf of authors is when an outfit like that, um, it's one thing to uh, help a writer realize their dream and be published. That's an amazing thing. And it's a wonderful service and, and definitely worthwhile because people are like, hey, I just dropped some money. I pay, I play, I'm, I'm good. My book is available. There are a number of them out there that are going to sell authors $10,000 marketing packages with the the belief and the promise that they're going to be a number one New York Times bestseller and all of these, oh right, lies, which really yeah. frustrate me because it's one thing to help a writer realize their dream and publish a book. It's another thing to deceive a writer into thinking something that's not true and selling them something that is not actually useful to anyone but the person selling it. And that's where I get very, as you can tell, very passionate uh, yeah. about that. So what I love to be able to try and do is, is educate and teach <laughs> authors, aspiring and that's what authors, we're here for, right? Teach to teach educate, aspiring awareness. authors, PEA, right there. Um, teach them uh, about the choices and options so they make the right decision and, and don't get fooled into believing something that may or may not be true. Right. So knowing, yes, I understand I'm working with a publisher that's charging me. I get it, but I understand what I'm paying for and I understand what I'm getting and I and I accept those terms. And that's one thing. But when it's, oh, I thought I had a real publisher and I thought they were going to do some stuff to promote me and I thought they were going to sell. No, they don't make their money off selling books. They make their money selling you services. <laughs> so and there is a lot of that out there right now. There is a lot of people that are writing books and <clears throat> and I'm I'm getting to the point where I'm like you, Mark, where I'm getting frustrated. Why not be upfront and say, hey, I want to publish a book. I need your help to publish this book. Pay me, get your story, and that's what you're going to get. Yeah. You know, be upfront, be honest. And we need that honesty out there because we're oh, actually sure. taking away from the people that are actually publishing companies out there, right? Because we're hurting each other by ju just giving everybody that fake fame, 
light is what I kind of call it, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I learned that because I've been in a couple of anthologies and I learned that, okay, well, but for me, it was writing to heal. So it was different. Like a lot of people said, oh, yeah. well, you're not making money. And I was like, I didn't write to make money. I made, I wrote to get my story heard. So there's right. a difference. I chose to do that where a lot of people are like, okay, well, I want to write in a book too. Well, yeah. depending what you're really looking for, like do your homework, do your research. And I think yeah. that's where I really wanted to have you on Mark was to get that education out there and to teach people that there are steps and there are guidelines and there are different levels of it. Yeah. You know, like this is vanity publishing and there's self publishing and there's publishing, you know, and what's the difference between a publishing house and not a publishing house? Well, I mean, I think uh, when I think of traditional publishing, the traditional publishing, the money always flows to the writer, to the IP creator, to the person who creates the content, because they say, oh, Miss Liz, your story is something that we know is going to help other people. We're going to publish it and we know that people are going to purchase this and they're going to benefit from it. We're going to invest in you. We're going to pay you usually uh, some sort of advance and then we'll pay you royalties after the advance is earned out. And, 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 you know, in, 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 in a case, the advance might be a thousand dollars, meaning that after you sell 500 copies of the book, then you start earning because you've out earned your advance. And that's a, that's a traditional publisher. Any publisher who has to call themselves a real publisher or a traditional publisher is a case of me think the lady got the test too much. It's a case of, you know, Penguin Random House, Harper Collins, Simon and Schuster, Hachette do not have to call themselves real publishers. They're real publishers by the way they behave, <laughs> um, and so that's something to be uh, suspicious of. And again, if your goal is just to get a book out there, but be aware that I don't want to do business with people who, who operate in deceptive practice. I'd right? rather you know work with someone who's upfront and says, "Hey, listen, I have I have." Contacts. I have people I can work. I can get uh, great editors for this package. Uh, you'll get a book edited. You'll get professional cover design, and you'll get your book distributed, available on all the major retail platforms, so other people can read your story and benefit. Right? Why? Why, why do we write? We write to connect with other people. Whether it's exactly. fiction, whether it's self-help, whether it's whatever, you, you're you're either going to inform, inspire, entertain, enlighten. All of those things, right? That's why we write. We want to connect to other people, make sure people realize they are not alone. That's that's it. That's that's the underlying uh, fundamental nature. So, you know, if you're up front and say, "This is what I this is what I can do for you," <laughs> but I'm not going to do anything else. Like I'm just yeah. gonna I'm gonna make the book available, and then I'm gonna move on to the next project. Um, <clears throat> when you, yeah, I don't know. I just I'd rather work with people who have that integrity and have that you know, transparency of what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. Right. Like be upfront so that people can decide for themselves. Stop selling the false hope and dream to people because it's exactly. getting, it's getting, it's getting to take away from real legit people that are working their butts off. Yeah. From the, from this, you know, this, this fake of I'm going to get you on, on time magazine. I'm going to get you a number one bestseller. I'm going to, but you're going to do the work. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. You know, where if I'm paying you and you're taking my story, what are you going to give me in return? Yeah. These are the questions that we need to start asking people when they're asking us to write in their books or to be a part of an anthology or a collection, yeah. you know, and that's where I've decided to do my own stuff now because I've done this and I've seen that, but I was unaware of it. But right from the get go, I had said I want to just get my story out there. So it yeah. wasn't about the profit. It wasn't about royalties. It was about getting it heard to make a difference. Yeah. And there are people like that that want just their stories heard. But the yeah. ones that don't want their stories just heard and they want to make a profit, and they want to get royalties, people should be up front and say it. You know, yeah. this is what my book project is. And this is what I'm going to give you. And this is not what you're going to get. So you can decide. No, I, I, that 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 understanding, that education, is so critical. I think so that authors are just making informed decisions, and they, they then they can decide what's right for them without worrying about people trying to manipulate or deceive them. Exactly. So, is there how many levels of self publishing is there? Well, there, there's there's sort of when you think about self publishing, you've got sort of three main areas, right? You've got vanity or um, uh, full service, 
right? Providers that allow you, you, you pay them and they, they publish. Then you have the DIY, which is, okay, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to hire all the people myself and I'm going to create an account with Amazon and with Kobo and with Google and with a distributor like draft to digital. And now I'm going to do all the legwork or hire someone to do that for me. <clears throat> and then there's other, uh, the, the type of self-publishing that um, most people have done and don't realize they've done already. And this is called community self-publishing. And this is where you can write and produce at will, uh, whatever schedule you want for free. And people can write or can consume that content completely for free at will whenever they want. So anyone who uses Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, <laughs> Facebook, go back to MySpace, they have a blog, they have a podcast, they're self-publishing. <laughs> Really, uh, that's community publishing. And, and and the goal with community publishing is engagement and interaction, usually, right? I post something and people like it or share or comment. And it's the engagement that makes that community self-publishing. So that's a good... Now, uh, an example of a platform where authors have used community self-publishing to skyrocket to huge success would be Wattpad.com. <clears throat> Wattpad is a Canadian founded company that allows you to write uh, serialized stories for free and people can read them for free. And there've been people have gone on uh, to have movies made from their, their hugely successful uh, stories that they, that they told on this free platform. So that's community publishing. And there's a lot of engagement and comments as you share each new chapter. And so, you know, for writers trying to, you know, find their voice and, and, and wonder what people think of something. That's a great platform that you can publish for free and people can comment for free. And then you can kind of test the waters and see, see if it's worthwhile. Like, is it worth me investing in an editor and maybe publishing this as a book? Um, I love that you say that, test the waters, because that's what we need to do, right? We need to research. We need to get educated. We need to ask the questions. Because if yeah. we don't ask the questions, we just sign a, con sign a contract, yeah, I'm writing in a book. And then, yeah. oh, I'm an author. Okay, but what did you really get from it? What learning experience did you get from it? Who did yeah. you work with? Or did you just write a chapter and send it in and that was it? And then all of a sudden this pretty book showed up and that was the end of it, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So I, I really, really enjoy having you here, Mark, and sharing this because I think a lot of people out there are unaware of all of the different levels of publishing, right? And yeah. unaware of how some anthologies or collections are being put together. You know, they're yeah. being sold to false hope and all that. So yeah. what message would you have as a sub self publisher for, for everyone out there on this? Uh, the message I have is um, understand the contracts, look at what rights you're giving up. Um, even whether you're paying or whether they're paying you, there is a contract to sign and what rights are you giving up? That's really, really important. Remembering that the value comes from your creativity and the things that you've written. Um, ask a lot of questions, like you said. I think that's one of the most important things you can do. And, and there are so many free resources online that you can double check. So one of the places I always go to is uh, Writer Beware. And if you just Google Writer Beware, Victoria Strauss has been running this website for oh, 15 to 18 years longer, probably. And it's a site that basically uh, points out markets uh, to sell your writing. And it also points out markets that are a little bit deceptive uh, in their business practices. And they may be people you don't want to work with. So anyone you go to work with, any publisher you want to work with, uh, even if they're offering you money, double check uh, Writer Beware. It's a great resource. It's free. And you can always just go. Uh, I would even Google uh, the name of the name of the person. It could be an editor you're wanting to work with or a designer. Maybe they have a track record of, of um, not not being true to their word. <laughs> that, that's an easy way to find out uh, some of those things. And um, I, I mean, I've written a bunch of books for writers specifically to help educate them. But I've done probably hundreds of interviews on podcasts that are free sharing as much advice as I can, because I think it's really, it's really important for me. I've been, I've been a writer for a long time and I've learned a lot of things, but if I don't take the time to pay it forward and to help other writers and to share what I have learned with other writers to help them and maybe even help them avoid some of the mistakes I've made over the years, 
um, that's a really great thing uh, to know that you can do that. And what I love about the, the, the various writing communities that exist is most writers are pretty empathetic. They're pretty understanding and they're willing to spend the time to talk to somebody who has questions. And uh, I mean, I'm in a number of different writer groups and I'm always happy to, to spend some time talking to people. And so if you're feeling alone, you know, there's online communities, obviously like online communities of people who watch this program, <clears throat> who, you know, or I saw some comments from Cheryl, et cetera, um, you know, that are getting benefit from these, these discussions. So there's probably communities like that, or there may be a local writers group through your local library or community center or whatever it is where you can connect with other writers and, and just help each other out and share. Like, I know something about A and you know something about B. Why don't we put our peanut butter and chocolate together and make something really awesome? Right, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. That, that's yeah. the way to go. Like, <laughs> you, you know, if, if you don't know, you, you can't change, right? And if we just assume we know the answers, then we never change anything. There's no solution to it. And, exactly. and this is why I want to have you on, Mark, and I want to have the guest on that will educate the listeners out there and be the one, I'll be the one asking the hard questions because a lot of people are scared to ask the questions, but Miss yeah. Liz is like, no, I want the answers. And if you have the answers, <laughs> I need them so other people can hear the answers because that's yeah. what it is. It's a pay it forward, right? The, yes. the, the spilling of the tea, the understanding, the teaching, the education, the awareness that if we don't know, and we just jump in and we assume that we know, then we're actually hurting ourselves in the long run because yeah. we might be working with somebody who is not the right person. And in five years, that might actually hurt us because that we worked with that person. Yeah, no, exactly. I, I completely agree with that. Yeah. So I want to get into a little bit of Mark now, since Mark is here, <laughs> we're talking about self publishing but you like craft beer. So what is it about the craft beer that you like? So, I always uh, I've traveled for a long time for, for work. And whenever I went to a new place, I would always like to try what's local. So uh, a local restaurant, uh, you know, a mom and pop uh, restaurant rather than a chain. What's your special? You know, oh, we have a special dessert. We're known for this. We're known for this <laughs> sandwich. We're known for whatever it is that they make. I would always ask when I was, you know, eating somewhere is, well, what is, are there any local beers? Rather than just buying a standard <clears throat> beer that's available everywhere what's local? Do you have anything local? And I always used to try that. And then that became the craft beer movement because a lot more microbrewers and, and, and small brewers would, would open up in different regions and they're making small batch beer, uh, craft beer, and they're experimenting, right? So they can experiment because it's not these giant, giant tanks. It's, uh, you know, we're making a tank that's only going to make X amount of beers or X amount of pour X amount of glasses. So we can experiment, we can try this different hop, or we can leave it in an extra, you know, several hours, or we can just add this one thing that's going to, you know, make the sugars happen. And, and again, I'm not a scientist, so I love listening to how they do it, but I have no comprehension. Just like I like driving cars, I just don't know how they work. I can't do it myself. I know how, where to put the oil on, where to put the gas, where to fill the windshield wiper fluid, that's it. <clears throat> I understand the high-level process of beers, and as many beer tours as I've been on, I just think, and I go... Yeah, you do that really well, and I like drinking what you make. And so <laughs> when I, travel, <laughs> I love talking to the brewers, talking to the people who own the breweries, learning about them, learning about the community, talking to the other people, the locals uh, sitting at the bar or at the whatever, and and just t just seeing the passion in their face when they talk about their the beer and oh, we just released this one and, and whatever. And then hearing the backstory is always so fascinating to me. And so that makes the beer taste that much better, that unique experience that you can connect in, uh, with other people. It's not all that different than writing and, and, and indie publishing, like, you know, craft publishing. So, so that's something uh, I really enjoy. And my partner and I, um, we met, um, we had our first date uh, at a brewery and, and we sort of bonded. And, and the two of us, I mean, she loves uh, different styles of beer than I do. There are some beers that we like the same, but... And we have great discussions when we try try different ones. And I was like, well, I know you don't like wheat-based beers, but this one you should try. And she said, well, I know you don't like sour beers, but this is one you should try. And so that's just, uh, I mean, we love, uh, we'll, we'll spend days, uh, you know, we'll travel to different parts of Ontario 
um, and, and, and say, okay, we're going to hit these three breweries. <laughs> and again, just try the samplers because, you know, we're driving. <laughs> we're just trying the little, with the flight. <laughs> just the little guys. <laughs> and then, and then you taste them. You taste like four or five different, you know, and we split the tasters. Um, and then we will buy stuff to take home. Like, oh, we like this one and this one. So we'll, we'll take a full, you know, like a six pack home or whatever of this one. And that is just so much fun. Uh, I just find it so creative and rewarding. And again, what a great way to get to meet people and, and, and listen to them talk about something they're passionate uh, about. That that really warms my heart. Well, I, I'm, I'm happy that you brought it up that it's almost like writing because as I'm right, I, I take notes when you guys are all talking. And so when the guests are talking, I take notes. And on the side here, I'm, I'm writing, building, learning, passion, backstories. And it's all it has to do with writing. It has to do with the story the passion yeah. behind it. Why are you sharing this with, with the public? You know, it's just like writing a book. Why are you sharing that with the public? Because yeah. you, it's all of the little steps all put together, like the editor, the publisher, the, you know, the copyrights, yeah. the, all, all of that stuff. Like every little baby step works together. It's like the beer, right? You need all exactly. of those ingredients. Yeah. So, and I think that's what intrigues you is in the beer because it's almost like the self publishing kind of aspect. It's all the little, pinpoints that are all put together right to make this beer yeah it's not that different some someone can say well i write i write cozy mysteries and i write cozy mysteries and these your cozy mysteries have a slightly different flavor than this person's cozy mysteries just like your ipa has a different kind of flavor than someone else's ipa and so you can you can enjoy the the genre of beer or the genre and enjoy all the different voices that exist within that and 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 yeah there's so many great parallels uh to, to that creativity but but often, yeah, the backstories are, are, are what really drive me. Just, you know, why it's, it's a huge investment to, to create a brewery. Why did you take that risk? <laughs> like, what was it that drove you to want to leave your great corporate job and, and, and suddenly and, and, be, and be working like endless hours at the small business? Because it's not easy yeah. running a small business. But it, often it's they're driven by those same passions. And I often find writers are often driven by, and even uh, publishers can be driven by the passion of, of, like you said, let's get the right books into the right reader's hands. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of just writing books, because I find that uh, many good books are being lost because we're just having people just write and write and write and write. If you're writing just to write, we're actually doing more damage. I find because you can all just write on a piece of paper, you know, and get that out yeah. there. But if, when we're really putting the passion and the purpose behind our stories and behind the books, then we're actually making an impact or making a change. Right. You know? So I think, I think it's deeply important for all the listeners out there to understand that it's so I'm not stopping anybody from writing a book, but do your research, ask the questions, get involved reach out to Mark, you know, because he has been in the business for a long time. Like, in 92, I had my first child in 92. So like, <laughs> it just goes to show that there is a lot of work behind it, right? Yeah, so I also yeah. noticed in your bio, Mark, that you were that you have been a speaker in many different countries. Could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, so it, it, um, it probably started when I was working at um, bookstore at McMaster University in Hamilton. Uh, I bought an espresso book machine, which is a, a machine that'll print and bind a book right on the spot in about 15 minutes from a digital file. Looks no oh. different than a trade paperback. Um, and I had the second in Canada, the ninth in the world. There's probably about 175 of them in the world uh, now. Uh, a lot a lot of them are owned by either libraries or some bookstores. And and, and you can go in and order, you know, actually all, all of my self-published books are actually available. You can go to any, any shop that has an espresso book machine and pretty much get almost every one of my books because they're digital files and you can push a button and print it right in the store. And, and, and because I was a, a, one of the pioneers uh, of that, I was going to talk to other school groups. I was going to talk to other businesses about how we invested. And it was $175,000 back in 2009 when I bought this machine. Um, wow. And how I had a plan to use it to save students money because we wanted to be able to print custom editions of textbooks. So instead of 20 chapters, we can only print six chapters. We And then the publisher, when we worked with publishers collaboratively, the publishers would then change the fee and say, we'll send you the files. You So we took the cost of printing and we were able to produce really inexpensive books that students actually bought and read the whole thing. 
And so instead of a $200 textbook, it was maybe a, a $40 book that was only, and they were going to read the whole thing, not just six of 20 chapters. And, and, and we used that. And then, and then we had local people who wanted to produce books. I had one jazz musician who was also a cartoonist. We had this book of cartoons about jazz and he would go and play gigs and he would, you know, manufacture CDs and sell the CDs at his gigs, but he would come back and every couple of weeks ago, oh, can I have another 20 books? And and I'd print 20 books off for him and sell them to him. And then he would obviously, I'd sell them to him a little bit above the print cost. He would have a retail price, so he would make some money. And I started going around and I started talking uh, to different businesses about how we were using the machine, how we were saving students money, how we were enabling local people who always wanted to publish a book. But, you know, like, you know, if you all want one copy, the machine will make you one copy. <laughs> like, you don't have to print a minimum, uh, whatever. And then uh, I, I joined Kobo uh, to create their self-publishing platform, and I started getting asked to talk on a bunch of different panels. And, and so over the years, it was you know going to Frankfurt to the book fair, which is kind of taking place right now in, in Germany, the world's biggest book fair, going to New York, going to Chicago, uh, going to London, going to Paris, going to Italy, uh, Milan, and, and talking about what's possible with digital publishing. And I realized my passion for writing and storytelling was parallel to my passion for speaking, for public speaking, because when you're public speaking, you're storytelling, you're sharing. And the beautiful thing, unlike writing, which is very solitary, and hopefully somebody reads it and maybe they'll leave a review or maybe you usually never hear from the writer or reader. But when I'm in front of a group of people, I can see the audience. I can see the looks on their faces. I can tell if I if I have them. I can tell if we're we're on this journey together or if I'm putting them to sleep. And well, and, if they start to fall asleep, then you know they're sleeping, right? Well, no, but you know, but you can adjust. I can I can yeah. test some jokes uh, early on, and if they're receptive to the jokes, I know I can do more. And if they're not receptive to the jokes, I can change my style. So you, it, it's it's like this dynamic oral storytelling tradition. I know uh, when the pandemic happened, I spent a lot of time doing, you know, virtual videos. And it was, I was in New Jersey to do a, a lunchtime keynote for a writer's conference. It was the very first in-person event I had done, you know, almost two years. And I remember we finished lunch and I was setting up and I had my slides. And I'm looking at the room of like 250 people. And, and, and I almost started to weep. I was so, I was so honored and so joyous that I could be in front of people and see their faces again for the first time in two years because that connection yeah is, is what powers me when i can when i can be talking to a room of people and see their eyes light up with the possibility and the wonder i mean i've had events i, I went to speak at an event and i had just before i was on, i was on stage and i was getting my papers ready and i was about to speak and i had someone from the audience come up and handed me a book and i said oh what's this he said, oh, i like i'd like you to have it i, I said oh that's cool is that yours he said yeah we published it after hearing your talk last year. We, we, we were inspired by something you said, and we created this project, and it's published, and we'd like to give you a copy. And I thought, oh, my God, that's the biggest honor, that I helped inspire you to do something creative in your own way, that you took what I said, you made it your own, and you did something. You didn't just follow what I did, because that's boring, but you yeah. took it, and you drove it with your own passion. Oh, my God, that's powerful. And so that's... What I love about speaking, um, and 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 again, yeah, it, again, it's a kind of storytelling when you think about it, right? Well, yeah, speaking is storytelling. It's just the oral, and and I'm like you. I like to see the expression, and that's why I love the video here because I can see if my guests are really engaged with me, or if they're yeah. just like, oh, what's the next question she's gonna bring me? You know, yeah. they roll the eyes or whatever. Where the audio, we don't see that. We don't see the eye rolling. We don't see if they're really right. engaged with us, right? And that's why I love doing the video with all yeah. of my guests is because I can see that they're really passionate. Um, and they're right here giving me this strong message, right? So I think yep. it's a good time to ask you, Mark, what would your T be if I gave you the word? Uh -huh. All right. So, uh, okay. So um, uh, I'll explain. Uh, truth, experimentation, and access. And and, and the truth is that, um, uh, you know, like you said, authenticity, truth, uh, just knowing what's legit. Experimentation because... 
you know, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to try different things along the way. It's good to test. It's good to experiment. It's good to try different things and fail. It's okay to fail. You just pick yourself up. The difference between success and failure is getting up one more time and, and trying one more thing. And, and access is, I think, writers have never had more access than ever before in the history of writing and publishing to uh, to make informed decisions. Uh, and I have access to all of these tools, all these technologies. Anyone can self-publish at any time at will, right? Anyone can uh, have a book, a print book, an ebook, an audio book, because they have access to stuff that was, was denied us. When I first started, I had to type a manuscript, mail it off, and and beg and hope that maybe some New York publisher would would want my story. Um, and so, yeah, I think that um, uh, truth, uh, experimentation, and access are probably uh, the kinds of tea that I enjoy sipping and sharing with others. And that's a really good, strong tea. And I think that's really a good one for a self-publisher, right? It's because you want the truth. You know, yeah. you really want you really want to hear the hard truth. Is it going to be easy? No, it's not going to be easy to write. If anyone yeah. tells you that it's easy to write, I I, I don't think they're working with the right people. <laughs> right. You know, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot of steps. It doesn't just write the chapter, send it in, and then it's done. It's boom. It's, you know, if it's done yeah. that way, then it's there. It's just a fast publish publication. You know, yeah. it's like writing a blog or something like that. But getting to know the team, getting to know the editors, getting to know the copy, like know your rights. Like <clears throat> when you're signing a contract, know that it's a copyright. You know, that you can't just keep writing it in another book. You have to really pay attention to the contracts and that. And yeah. and for everyone that's listening and that will watch the replay later, please ask the questions. Me and Mark have both said it tonight. Please ask the questions because you just never know. The small print in a contract, your story could be taken. Taken from memoir or something later, you can't because you you're bound by law with these copyrights and that. So I want to get a little bit into the copyrights because a lot of people don't understand copyright. Right. Could you share a little bit on that, Mark? Well, I should start by saying I am not a lawyer, nor does this constitute legal advice, but <laughs> a couple <laughs> things with copyright to know. But I have studied copyright a lot uh, uh, when I worked in academic book selling and, and obviously in writing and publishing. But so in Canada and the US, when you write something down on paper, little note chicken scratch that I just put down it's actually protected by copyright the challenge is the onus is the onus is on me proving that I wrote that and you didn't yeah. and that's where you get copyright legislation and, and, and registering and stuff like that but for the most part when you've written something you own the copyright to it now unless you're writing um, uh, you're watching a movie and you're, and you're writing the dialogue word for word of what someone's saying. Well, that's a violation of someone else's. Copy. Now, there's fair use and you can quote when you're reviewing, when you're uh, doing analytics or you're doing parody. You're allowed to quote and, 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 and reference uh, the material. But um, with copyright, when, when you sell your work to a publisher, they're licensing the right to use those words in a particular format that's specified, usually print and ebook and audiobook rights, and there's the different rights. You can have one and not the other. Usually in a territory, I'm going to purchase Canadian rights in the English language for this book. And then they may also uh, purchase subsidiary rights, which may be the option to translate and stuff like that. So the contract with the publisher basically says, you, the writer, own the copyright, you're licensing these rights to us for X amount of time. Now, it may be until the book is declared out of print. It may be until whatever. When I sell a short story, for example, oftentimes the contract is, we'll pay you X for the story. We'll print it in this journal, magazine. And six months to 12 months to two years after it's been published, the rights revert back to you. And then I can sell secondary rights. Uh, a lot of authors I know who had uh, contracts with the New York publishers, the book has gone out of print and the rights have reverted back to them. And then they're just, they're reissuing the book under their own imprint as a self-published author because they probably, there's fans and readers that uh, want the want the book. I mean, there's an old saying from Bay Used Books in Sudbury where I, where I grew up. And they had a saying that was, um, any book you haven't read is a new book. 
And and the same thing is true. Just because a book came out, you know, years ago doesn't mean it's not going to be pertinent. Look at the Queen's Gambit, a book that was published in the 70s or 80s. Suddenly everyone's reading and it became a bestseller um, because of a Netflix series uh, a couple of years ago. So I think um, understanding copyright, uh, understanding not violating someone else's copyright and understanding what you're licensing to a publisher is really, <clears throat> is really important. Um, and, uh, and so when you look at any book, you pick up any book, you usually see copyright year and the name of the copyright owner. So even the books that I've licensed to Gundern, Canada's largest independent publisher, on the copyright page, it says copyright 2018, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. I still own the copyright. I've just licensed it to them. Yep. <laughs> I've, I've given them the permission to print it and put it in books and, and ship them to bookstores and sell them. And I get a small cut every time they sell one. Uh, so that's. Uh, I hope that helps with understanding copyright a little bit. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And, and every little information that we can get out there to the listeners or viewers, you know, because some people just don't know. They just assume, okay, I just sign my name and write a chapter and boom, it's done. But really start reading the contracts before you start signing stuff off and that. Yeah. So I had promoted the wide for the win on your poster when I, and when I put your flyer out. So could you tell yeah. us a little bit about that book since that was on your poster? <laughs> Yeah, so Wide for the Win um, it was a movement. Uh, it's a Facebook group called Wide for the Win. And it was created by a romance writer, um, Aaron Wright, and a good friend of hers, Susie McConnell. Now, they're both romance writers. And they were frustrated with the fact that most of the writers groups on, on Facebook or anywhere else were all just giving advice about Amazon and Amazon only. And there was Amazon this and Amazon that and Amazon the other thing and Amazon, Amazon that. And they wanted to know, well, how can I be successful on Apple? How can I be successful on Barnes Noble Nook? How can I be successful on Kobo? How can I be successful on Google Play? How can I be successful on Smashwords or uh, other other platforms? Because there's there's you know there's the big five, but there's a lot more other platforms. And I had written a book after I left Kobo. Uh, I was there for six years, and my book was called Killing It on Kobo. And the whole idea, because I like alliteration, the whole idea was how can I help educate writers to be able to sell more on Kobo and make more money based on what I know about this company. And, and again, it was all stuff that was revealed publicly. It wasn't like I was giving away insider secrets, but I was collecting all of this information I had given out over the years and Kobo had shared over the years. And I collected as much as I could to help authors to find it in one place. And Aaron had reached out to me and said, I, I'm, I want to write a book called Wide for the Win and inspired by killing it on Kobo. And I'm like, oh, that sounds so cool. Let me know how it goes. She ended up... Um, Spending two years, it was just too much. She was taking away her writing, and her readers were getting upset because she hadn't released a new book. And so she went back to releasing books for them. And so I, I asked her if it was okay if I used the title, and I, and I wrote the book. It's about a four hundred page book, but it's a, it's a look at, and wide is a term I should explain that is used in indie publishing spaces. So when you self-publish, you have a choice: Kindle Direct Publishing from Amazon has an option called uh, KDP Select, which makes your book exclusive for 90 days. The contract is you cannot publish the ebook anywhere else. It has to be exclusive to Amazon for 90 days, and it'll be available in the Kindle Unlimited program where you can get access to other thick page reads and other bonuses. So there's a, a phrase in indie publishing that is, uh, a, do you publish wide or exclusive? Like do you publish wide versus exclusive to Kindle. And and so the term wide for the win was about being wide. Now, my wide is even bigger than the average indie author because my wide isn't just, yes, I want it on Amazon, but I also want it on Kobo and Apple and Nook and Google. And I want anyone to be able to buy my book anywhere. I want them to be able to get them at libraries. But I'm also wide in the fact that I'm also open to working with traditional publishers. So wide for the win is a, is a look at the wide mindset. It's a look at a high level look at a whole bunch of the platforms. And you know why is uh, why are Amazon and Google Play very similar? Why are Apple and Nook and Kobo different? The differentiating factor, one of them being that uh, Kobo and Nook and uh, Apple, uh, all the people who work there, are more like traditional booksellers. They're human curation and they merchandise very much, whereas Amazon and Google are algorithmic based. And so, just understanding that as an author can help you market properly because. In one case, you're marketing to the algorithm, and in other cases, you're marketing to humans. 
uh, who actually read books and look at look at what is that's just not just pieces of data to them. And so, yeah, wide for the win is just sort of a look at that mindset, and it explains well. Here are the options available to you if you if you choose self publishing. Here are all the platforms you can use, and here's you know whatever and. And if you're looking at a publishing contract, here are the things you need to be careful about. <laughs> so um, it was, yeah, it was, um, it was a, a lot of hard work to write that book. But um, I think for anyone who's just looking to understand the possibilities of what's available, it probably offers a pretty comprehensive uh, look. And it's also obviously through my perspective. And so there's a lot of my own biases in there. Um, and there's a lot of anecdotes based on uh, authors I've worked with over the years and, and my own experiences, because again, I'm, I, you know, I share, here's, here's how it works for me. It may not work for you this way, but this is how it works for me. So that, that was, that's been a fun, uh, a fun, uh, group to be a part of the Facebook group. And it's also a fun, uh, it's been a fun book because I've heard from a lot of people that really, uh, have found something valuable in it. And, and again, they might like this one thing and this other one thing great. They found something, they got some value. Fantastic. My, you know, I've, I've done my work here. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with that. Well, and I just learned something different, like the wide and the exclusive. I never knew anything about that. And the 90 day <laughs> kind of probo uh, probation, like, you know, you can't go anywhere <laughs> else. Like you're stuck here. It's almost like the job, right? You do your 90 days and then we decide if we're going somewhere else. Right. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, but there's, there's better, so much I mean... that we don't know that we need to know. And exactly. the listeners out there go out and grab this copy, like uh, a wide for the win, you know, by Mark Leslie. And check out all of his other books because, Mark, you have over 25 books, right? And I did see yeah. on your website that you have some were werewolf books. Yeah. Yeah. I um, <laughs> uh, A Canadian werewolf in New York is, uh, was a standalone novel. And, and the premise was I was wondering, well, what would happen if, you know, if I lived in Manhattan and I was cursed with a werewolf curse and I turned into a wolf every full moon? Where would I go and run around? When, when I finished running around as a wolf, where would I find clothes to get back? So how would I logistically deal with it? So it was kind of like a humorous look at this uh, this writer living in Manhattan who's cursed with lycanthropy. And also he has special powers as a human, so extra sense. Uh, so he can smell and hear things a lot better than the average human and has a little bit of extra strength. So he uses them a, like a superhero because I'm a big fan of Spider-Man. And so... A Canadian werewolf in New York is a day in the life of this poor fool who wakes up naked in Battery Park with a bullet hole in his leg and the taste of blood in his mouth. And he says, what the heck did I do last night? Because he has no memory. And that spun into a series uh, followed by Stowaway where he's on a train headed for Stow, Vermont. And, it, and, it, and he's there. He's helping someone on the train. But the train's going to get to Vermont before sundown and he's going to turn into a wolf. So he's kind of trapped. Um, Fear and Longing in Los Angeles is when he goes to L.A. To, to work on a movie set based on one of his books. Fright Night's Big City is, uh, you know, these uh, really scary neo-Nazis are taking over New York <laughs> and he's trying to stop them. And uh, and then Lover's Moon, which is a complete de departure, was um, uh, a romance uh, for in this world between Michael and his best friend, Gail. So they're, they're really good friends. And this is the backstory of how they used to be a couple. And this is how they met and fell in love all those years ago. So it's their, that love story. And then uh, Julie and I are, are currently in the process of writing Hex and the City, which will be book six in the series. And that's coming out in March. And uh, it has been an absolute blast to write this humorous urban fantasy adventure of this apologetic um, I call Michael Andrews my main character. He is an alpha wolf, but a beta human. And uh, it's just sort of funny and cheeky. And it's just been a, a, a riot to write. And people people seem to have enjoyed the fact that it's not the werewolf tale they expect. It's a little bit different. It's not like he doesn't turn into an actual werewolf and run around and, 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 and maul people or any anything like that. He just turns into a wolf. And, and so how does he deal with that? How does he try to live a normal life? How can you have a relationship when you have to go sneak away for 10 days and turn into a wolf every night to a full moon, right? That, that, that's why him and his girlfriend originally broke up because she thought he was doing, he was, he was, <laughs> he was all somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she didn't know he was howling at the moon. She thought he was, he was stepping out, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's just, that's just been a fun series to write. 
But your life is almost like a craft beer. Like it's all the different flavors and blends that come all together, right? Yeah, all the different flavors. Self-publishing, editor, speaker, you know, uh, creator. Like you sound like an awesome craft beer. Like, I don't know, (laughs) are you a sour beer or are you a... Are you a bar a um, wheat? Like, I, how would you I, describe I th- yourself? I think I've got to. I've got to be a uh, stout. I've probably got to be like a coconut chocolate stout, maybe a nice hearty, <laughs> <laughs> hearty. You, know, you can have it for dessert, or you can just sip it. Um, just be something to enjoy at the end of uh, at the end of a good meal. Um, but no, yeah, it's it's so it's so much fun. I'd rather be the brewery than the beer because I think I write in different genres. I engage in different ways. So it's like, well, I feel like an IPA now. I feel like a, I feel like <laughs> I feel like a lager. I feel like a pilsner. You know, <laughs> I want to try every little spot in the, in the brewery, right? Exactly. I want to taste a little bit of everything. <laughs> so, Mark, when I asked you one word to describe yourself as a as a person, you gave me the word eclectic. Eclectic. Am I saying it right? Yeah. So, w- what about that word? Describe well, it. so eclectic is, is, is like little bits of everything, right? It, it's kind of like I'm a little bit of this, I'm a little bit of that, I'm a little bit country, I'm a little bit rock and roll. And so when I think about myself as a, a you know a book nerd, uh, a person who's worked in the book industry for a long time, I'm an author, but I'm an author of true ghost stories. I'm an author of nonfiction uh, books for writers about the business of writing and publishing. I'm an author of a, a humorous fantasy paranormal adventure, the Canadian werewolf series. I'm an author of horror novels. I'm an editor of different anthologies of speculative fiction. I've written science fiction. I've written fantasy. I've written horror. I, I, I really, uh, I've written a romance novel. Um, and so just with my writer hat alone, it's all these different genres then I'm a speaker, and I've worked in the book industry as a bookseller, as a book industry consultant. I can advise authors on, you know, how to work with draft to digital or Kobo or Kindle Direct Publishing, how to work with publishers, how to work with agents, and um, and 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 I love uh, speaking. I love storytelling. God, I love telling ghost stories to a live audience. It's so much fun because you can see them lean in, and you can see who's really scared. <laughs> where are we going? That's when you this? know. That's when you know when you do the jump scare, they're going to be the ones that jump through the the ceiling. And so eclectic is, and and, and I love craft beer, and and I love doing stuff with my partner, and uh, and 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 Liz and I, for example, like we have these great Halloween decorations. We love doing creative stuff in the house. We love hanging out with friends. We love laughing. I've do, written parody songs. We've performed together. Um, so eclectic is kind of like I. I, I I I live and breathe in in ideas and exchange of ideas and in embracing all these little nuances and different things that you can be. You don't have to just be one thing. So eclectic, I think, describes me quite well. So we have less than two minutes left, Mark. What final words would you have for all the listeners out there tonight? <laughs> well, if you if you want to write, just remember you've never had there's never been more opportunities and more options than ever before in the history of writing and publishing. If you have a story that you want to share there, understand your goal and your dream. Is the goal just to get it out there to connect with someone else and help them? Is your goal to sell? Ask a lot of questions. And whatever you do, do not give up on yourself. Your story. The things you want to share are worth sharing because the chances are if you take the time to share them, it's going to help other people. It may inspire, entertain, inform uh, any of those things as someone else. And just let that other person know that you are not alone. And that's one of the most powerful things we can do. So never give up on yourself. Well, thank you so much, Mark. It was an honor to have you and to learn so much tonight. My paper is full of notes. Like I am like, I'm going to check this out. I'm going to check that out, you know, because I, I, I myself did not know. So I want to thank you for educating me as well tonight. And I want to thank all the listeners and viewers out there who do tune in and who do watch the replay. Please let me know where you're tuning in. If you'd like to reach out to Mark, you can check him out on his website. He's also on all social media platforms. Check out his YouTube channel. You get to see a little bit about Spider-Man. I've been checking out your YouTube a little bit there, Mark. So I I do see this Spider-Man. And I will see everybody back here for a new tea time on October 20th when I bring in Larry Joe Jensen from the United States. And he'll be talking about shipwrecks 
and rescues. So, and it is based on true stories of the Superior Lake. So that should be interesting. So we'll learn a little bit about that, some history and some journalism and all of that good stuff. So if you have any of those questions you would like to have answered, tune into that show. And again, thank you, Mark, for joining me tonight. And thank you to all the viewers and listeners out there who do make a difference. And we do make a difference by spilling our true authentic selves when we spill our teas. So I'll see everyone October 20th at 3 p.m. in the afternoon with Larry George Jensen.